most intelligent species, a natural architect capable of constructing dams and lodges, managing waterways and felling trees magnitudes of times its own size. Beavers once dominated Britain and the rest of Europe, but due to extensive hunting at the turn of the 20th century, the global population had fallen to just a few thousand and they've been vacant from the British Isles since the 1500s. But now, with the support of some of the finest ecologists and conservationists, beavers are back and transforming British landscapes once again. This is the remarkable story of British beavers, nature's engineers. Director of conservation charity Wildwood Trust, Peter Smith is a specialist in the rewilding of British species and has been an advocate for the return of beavers for over 20 years, playing an instrumental role in the return of the species. The beavers from a long line of semi-aquatic mammals that have existed for millions and millions of years. They're amazing animals. You can see that when they glide through the water, their noses, their eyes and their ears all on the plane of the water, so they have as small a surface sticking out the water. They've got the huge tails, which they power them swiftly through the water. They've got web back feet that push them along, so they're beautiful animals. They've got incredible fur, the densest fur in the mammal kingdom that will um, keep them warm in any conditions. They've got these razor-sharp teeth that can just slice away at the bark of the pest of trees and easily gnaw them down. Trees have adapted to this, and it's almost like they live in symbiosis because the trees that live in our wetlands, especially trees like aspen, which is very rare now in Britain, have a relationship with beaver. Even though the beavers gnaw them down, they regrow, and the beavers create the conditions for them to thrive. The first thing a beaver wants to do is make a home for itself, and that's not a lodge when they first come into the area. They're just going to make a burrow in a riverbank make a little hole where they sit. Then they're going to think about food. They're going to think about how am I going to eat? What am I going to eat? And then you start getting habitat modification, often maybe 10 years after you introduce a beaver, where they're going to start burrowing into riverbanks and the water trickles down, then the soil changes and you get new plants growing there, all the kind of plants that provide food for beavers. The beaver would have affected 20 to 30 percent of the whole land surface of Europe and North America. It's a you know huge amount of land that was beaver wetland. So there's a, all their adaptations come together to allow beavers to live in this fantastic wetland ecosystem that they create, and all the other animals and plants can be part of together. Southeast of Kent exists a relic of ancient Britain. The last surviving fenland in southeast England, Ham Fen, was once home to an array of rare wildlife and plants. But owing to extensive land drainage for agriculture in the late 80s, the fen was left in a state of despair, decimating some of Britain's rarest species. In an effort to restore the fenland, the Kent Wildlife Trust established the Ham Fen Reserve in 1991. But faced with the high costs and troublesome logistics of restoring the habitat, they made the decision to let nature restore itself. When I got to Kent Wildlife Trust, then with the wonderful staff here, the, the reserve uh, managers for this site, also wanted to have beavers and we hatched a plan to get beavers back and we created the Kent Beaver Project and Kent Wildlife Trust did some wonderful things. All behind me here was, it was all drying out, all the wildlife was gone and they spent a fortune trying to get all of this wildlife back by using diggers, and dumpers and earth scrapers, you know the last Fenland in the southeast of England. Some of the rarest creatures lived here 
and spending tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds wasn't saving the wildlife, but beavers could do it. So we went into this huge project to get the beavers back. We, I raised the money for them, that was my job, and to do some of the project management. But that was a lot of hard work, and nobody, a lot of people in government didn't want us to do it. It was only good quality um, campaigning to get the environment minister to let us do it. Some wonderful people in natural England, or English nature as it was then, getting these different people to understand why beavers were such a good idea and join the project. Bringing beavers back was a complex problem. Some of the science wasn't really that good. Uh, originally, we were told we had to bring beavers from Norway. So we flew off to Norway. We worked with wonderful people at Telemark University. Um, and they of monitoring beavers so they knew which ones were uh, didn't have a family and we could pick up. We spent a week there uh, capturing the beavers up, they were all boxed up um, so it was great for, but we had to solve all those problems of quarantining, all the health checks, making sure you do things properly. Some of them didn't uh, breed so well so we've got some more from Bavaria which is the largest population in Europe and because the last beavers in Europe were all brought together in the 1950s and 60s in Bavaria. It has got the um, widest genetic diversity. What's behind us is Britain's first proper rewilding project, um, and it's been sitting here since 2002, quietly getting better and better for wildlife. The water table's coming up, the habitat changes are slowly happening. If it wasn't for the beavers, what behind me would be a, a woodland, yes, but the last bit of Fenland in the southeast would have gone. Essentially, beavers will chop down certain trees, but that's to feed off their bar. But they really, they are water managers, so they're gonna burrow into riverbanks, and then that's gonna fill with water. And they keep, just keep doing that. And that creates these wet soils, which then you have different types of plants and animals living on it and you have different trees growing on it in time. So they're just rehydrating certain areas um, of the land. Now here, where the water is now extending all over, that has all the benefits for the wildlife that was lost here. Um, last Fenland, it was gonna disappear, it's now recreated it. And that means that you've got something that man just couldn't afford to do. We couldn't do this ourselves. Scientific reports are coming out all the time saying we've lost all these bee species, we've lost all these insects, all these birds have gone. Well, it's because there's just nowhere left for them to live. There's no food for them. Beavers recreate a really important part of that mix. So to biodiversity, it's huge. The number of species that rely on beavers is ginormous. It's thousands of species, not just hundreds, it's thousands of species that can come back. And somewhere like this, it's so complex, you'll never understand all the tiny little moths, the little insects, the ants, the birds that live off them. You know, it's a whole complex web that comes out of what a beaver can do. It's a really amazing um, keystone to the whole habitats of wetlands. So if you go and calculate all the species that are going extinct, all your species that you've got, biodiversity action plans and all this kind of stuff, about 30% of them will be saved by having beavers back in the country. The Ham Fen project was a success and inspired similar enclosed beaver projects across England, from Devon to the Forest of Dean, and most recently a project based in Essex, all putting the beavers to work, either to restore their environment or alleviate flooding in their local areas. But in the early 2000s in Scotland, Rumours began circulating of a wild population of beavers living in Tayside. Ecologist and beaver enthusiasts Louise and Paul Ramsey were some of the first to hear the rumours and went on to play an important part in the return of the British beavers. I think it was 2000... Well... There were sightings, actually the first sighting was in 2001, which was before we had beavers. There was one um, spotted on the confluence of the urn and fog uh, by some canoeists, um, who were friends of ours actually. Um, and he saw this creature with a flat tail. 
climbing out of the water. He knew it wasn't an otter. So, um, because they knew that we were interested in beavers, that this news reached our ears, I think by email or phone call. And um, so, yeah, so there was, that was the very first, 2001. A few people who were observant people who were spending time by rivers, maybe fishermen or people who like to walk their dogs along riverbanks, started spotting them. And I think they, to some extent, the knowledge was kept secret because there was this feeling that maybe, you know, officialdom wouldn't, would try and remove them. Uh, there was a place called Sandy Nows. They were suddenly cutting down trees around this fishing loch, and um, the owner was a bit like, what's going on here? Called the police, thought it was vandals, and then turned out it was a beaver at work. And that was probably about 2007 or 8. When it became public knowledge, by 2010, the official response was that they should go. The SNH made a huge list of reasons. The farmers were worried about flooding. Fishermen were worried about salmon getting up past the dams. And then there was all the business of them somehow querying the pitch for the official trial. We heard sort of through our connections, our network of connections, that there had been a meeting. It was one of these stakeholder groups, and they had representatives from farmers and fishermen and foresters, but also from Scottish Wild Life Trust and a lot of green bodies as well. And it was chaired by SNH, Scottish Natural Heritage. And they made this decision that the Tay Beavers would go, they would be trapped out. And we just said, well, this won't do, this will have, we're going to oppose this. So I just sat there and I thought, right, I'm going to set up a campaigning Facebook group. So that was how we started. This group of people collectively decided that we should, we should found a local organisation. And they decided that it should be called Scottish Wild Beaver Group. I'd called the campaign Save the Free Beavers of the Tay, because I thought it, should, it, it needed to have that kind of revolutionary ring to it. Um, but they said that we needed to use the word wild because the government and some of the other organizations and farmers and so on were using the word, words like feral or criminal or illegally released. And so we thought we don't want this, this word feral to be bandied about. So we chose the word wild just to indicate that these are wild animals and part of our wildlife. The Scottish Wild Beaver Group campaigned for the protection of the wild beavers of the Tay. And in 2012, the government retracted their decision to remove the wild beavers. The Scottish National Heritage established the Tayside Beaver Study Group. Enthusiasts continued to rise. And soon the beavers of the Tay became a popular attraction for ecotourism. In Blegari, in the heart of the Tay catchment, local resident Bob Smith knows the Tayside beavers better than anyone and provides beaver tours for those hoping to see the intriguing animals. Around about 2009, a friend and I were on a canoe on the Isla, which is just about three miles, two and a half, three miles down the river. And we came across some what looked like beaver chewed trees. And from there on in, I had decided to find out more about the beavers and see if it could, in the end, find them. So after about a week or so looking about, my brother, in fact, came across one when he was uh, fishing here and uh, gave me the location. I came down and I've been watching them ever since. And I think in total, uh, through my wildlife tours, I've taken just short of 2,000 people here. That has also benefited my local community. So I've got B&Bs that, that people are staying with them. I've got the shops, I've got hotels that people are staying. That's only good for the area. However, they are an integral part of our uh, ecology. The biodiversity that they cause and create by the river is intense. It's just incredible what you see here now. We've also got big uh, otter population here now, which is partly down to the beavers. The fish also appreciate the insects that have fallen in, that have been eating the dead woody debris by the side of the river, so that falls into the water. The fish feed on that all the same. It's just uh, it's something to see. The beavers here, it's thought, uh, regardless of some of the rumours that go around saying they were dumped here illegally, have 
are probably or most likely being escapees, dispersers from private collections. Now, there are several private collections in the area. These beavers will mate, and in the main, the female here, she's having on average around about three kits per year. Start getting these kits, uh, they leave at 18 months, two year old, and they'll then mate, they'll then produce, and so on and so forth. So you get uh, quite a population boom relatively quick. Plus the fact nobody knew they were here, so they're left alone for probably more than 10 years, if not more, before anybody really started to get concerned about them. In 2011, we reckon there was 75 beavers in the take catchment area. Uh, in 2015, I reckon there was about 450, 500 beavers in the take catchment area. However, with the continued and ongoing culling by uh, farmers and landowners who don't want them on the land, uh, the numbers have probably stuck at 450, 400, 450, maybe less. Who knows for certain. Although the wild beavers of the Tay were allowed to stay, they had no legal status, meaning farmers and landowners were free to destroy the beavers' dams and even shoot them. While nobody knows for sure how many beavers have lost their lives to this unregulated culling, hundreds of carcasses have been found. Scottish Environmental Minister Rosanna Cunningham announced in November of 2016 that the beaver would soon be given the status of being both a native and a protected species, but delayed the status for over a year before finally announcing that it would become effective from the 1st of May 2019. A lot of um, landowners and their, you know, their employees, their gamekeepers and their gillies and so on, um, and have been arranging for them to be shot. They do cause issues, there's no two doubts about that, they do cause issues. Certainly in this low-lying uh, area down in Strathmore. Beavers are British inclined to block the culverts that go under roads. Uh, they think it's a good place to build a dam. Flooding fields and so on and so forth. And a range of concerns, some of them actually pretty understandable and some of them, you know, some of them are understandable but wrong. Oh, the way we treat our people, it should be the way that we are now treating our animals. We, very often, they're not looking, we feel, for the options, the alternatives to shooting. We're clever enough, we're civilised enough to actually be looking after our own planet and looking after our local wildlife. There are some very clever techniques, um, such as flow devices. Which is also called the beaver deceiver. And uh, you build into the dams with a pipe, which goes through the dam, and there's a six metre length of pipe goes out back into the pond. Um, and then it won't get more than a certain size, and so it won't flood more than a moderate amount of land. I mean, it just causes a little pool to occur. Personally, I'm disgusted the way the Scottish Government treats their wildlife. The Government and SNH have been very, you know, very much lobbied by farmers on this. And Beavers, even though they're protected, come the 1st of May. They've been persuaded that they should give these people a licensing regime, which is reasonably lenient. 200 people have been through courses now to shoot beavers. And what, what we've been realising, looking into the detail, is that they're really giving this leniency to what they call prime agricultural land. That was a day after they announced the protection. Turns out that something like 80% of the tay beavers are actually on prime agricultural land. Now, if that's how you treat your protected animals in Scotland, uh, they really need to have a look at themselves. We're facing a climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis and the beavers can help us with both these things which are which is just amazing i mean it's it's almost miraculous things need to change rapidly before we lose them all we've already lost the beavers 400 years ago due to persecution mass hunting etc we've got them back now let's protect them let's keep them here once it's gone it's gone you know so Like anything, when you start doing these things as a young man, you're full of energy and you want to change the world and you want to make your mark. So we want to see that. And if I can help other people doing that, that's great. Uh, Wildwood's now got 100 and odd people working from it, so there's lots more people doing their own thing now. We've got clever people doing clever things. We've got a huge range of projects to go that we're, we're going we're gonna to rebuild.
our ecosystems. But we've now got plans for the reintroduction. We've been reintroducing red squirrels for many years. Pine martens, natural grazing systems with bison and wild horses. We need to get back to understanding why nature is so important. We're not separate from nature. Man is nature. I remember when I was a young chap, people, you know, saying you can't change the world. You can't change the world. That's insane. Of course you can. But you can leave the world a tiny little bit better than when you arrived. And if we all had that attitude, that we could try to make the world a tiny little bit better, then I will go to my grave a happy man.